Hey everybody, this is Russ from Retro Game Core. So about a week ago, I reviewed this device here, the Ambernic RG552. And there are a lot of things I like about this device. It has an incredible screen and some really nice build quality too. That being said, there are a couple features that I think are missing on a device like this, which costs over $225. My primary concern has to do with the shoulder buttons and the lack of 5 GHz Wi-Fi, which really makes this device not very suitable for streaming. But the other concern I have is about the firmware that's available on this device. The RG552 actually ships with two different firmware options. You can boot Android operating system, and it also ships with a version of Botticera, which is a Linux-based operating system. And in particular, the Linux operating system is not very well configured. And so I spent the past week or so actually configuring everything to make it work a little bit better. Now, until we have custom firmware, we're probably not gonna see any performance gains. But all the same, I wanted to make sure that we took advantage of the beautiful screen that we have on this device. And so what I've done here is I've pre-configured all the different resolutions and aspect ratios to give you an ideal retro gaming experience. And on top of that, I've added a couple of quality of life tweaks. For example, I've improved the hotkeys across the board. I've also added a bunch of different themes and the ability to download new themes directly onto the device. And I've also implemented autosave and auto load so you can jump right back into your game. And so while we wait for custom firmware to be available properly on this device, I figure that this pre-configured SD card image is going to be our best bet while we wait. So in the video description, I'll have a written guide which will walk you through how to install all of this, and obviously we're going to do that here in this video as well. And I just want to leave you with one caveat before we get into the actual video, and that is that this is really going to be meant for all of your classic and retro systems. In particular, I only focused on PS1 and below gameplay, because the honest truth is that the Android operating system that's available on this device can run all of those other systems much better than this Linux one. And so my recommendation is to use the Linux side for all of the retro systems because the interface with emulation station is just a joy to navigate. And then if you want to punch it up to some of the harder systems like PSP and Nintendo 64, I recommend doing that on Android. Anyway, I think you'll really enjoy this video. So without any further delay, let's jump into it. Okay, so first thing, your device likely came with a 16 gigabyte micro SD card like this one. And this houses the Linux operating system, but it also has some files that we need too. When you plug it into your computer, you're gonna find three different partitions. The first one is called Ambernic. That's just a bunch of boot files. Don't worry about this one. And the second one is actually a Linux partition. That's why it's not properly readable by Windows. But the third one is called Games. That's the one we need to open up here. And in this partition, there are two folders we need to pay attention to. The first one's called save, so that's where all your save games are gonna be. If you have any saves you wanna move over, you're gonna to wanna to copy this to your desktop. And then also, no matter what, you wanna save all these BIOS files as well. These are the system files that you're gonna to need to run everything properly. So grab that BIOS folder and maybe the saves one as well and copy those over to your desktop or somewhere else on your computer for safekeeping. I've already done that previously, so I'm not gonna do it here, but just make sure you do that. And that's it, you don't need the SD card anymore, go ahead and eject it. Now the card that comes with the device isn't the best, so I recommend replacing it with a SanDisk card here. 16 gigabytes is gonna be plenty of space for the Linux operating system, and this card is a lot more reliable. On top of that, you're gonna to wanna to have a storage card for all of your games as well. I recommend using a SanDisk or maybe a Samsung card. Personally, I like to use 128 gigs, but you could go up to 256 or even 512, one terabyte, it's all up to you. Now, on my website, I'm going to have a written guide here, and this is going to show you everything you need. The most important thing here is to find the pre-configured stock Linux image. And this is what we're going to burn onto that 16 gigabyte SD card. So just go ahead and click on the link here that says SD card image, and then just download the file here. It's going to be between 3 and 4 gigabytes altogether. And while it shows a zip file here in this footage, it's going to be a 7-zip file, so if you see a .7z, don't freak out. It's just a different type of file system. It's all going to work the same. Okay, and then once you have it downloaded and saved to your computer, what you want to do is unzip this file. You can either use 7-zip or WinRAR to do this. After that, you're going to be left with a .img file, and it should be under 8 gigabytes altogether. And this is the file that we're going to flash onto the SD card. To do that, you have several different software options. We're going to use one here called Win32 Disk Imager, but other options include Balena Etcher as well as Rufus. Regardless of what software option you use, it's going to be the same process. Just navigate to the img file, and then make sure that you've selected the correct drive for whatever the 16 gigabyte SD card is. At that point, click on the right button and it's going to ask you, do you really want to do this? And you say, yeah, man, I want to do it. At that point, it's going to take maybe 10 minutes to burn altogether. So go ahead and make yourself a cup of coffee or eat some gummy worms, whatever you want to do. 
And when it's first done writing, it's going to pop up a bunch of windows and say things about having to format the drive. Just go ahead and ignore all of this stuff. It's because it's trying to read that Linux partition. At this point, you can close out a Win32 disk imager, and then we have to use a different program now to expand the SD card partition. And for this, we're going to need an app called Disk Genius. And I'll have a link to download it in the written guide if you don't already have it. Once it's open, you're going to want to go to the SD card here. And what we want to do here is expand the games partition so that it takes up all the free space. So just right click on that and select resize partition and then just drag it all the way to the right and then select start. It's going to ask you, do you really want to do this? And you say yes. This will take a few minutes to expand, but after that, it'll say complete. And there we go. The SD card is all set up now. We have one last step to do before we can put it back into the device, and that is to add all those BIOS files. And like I mentioned before, these are system files that are necessary to run certain emulators, for example, Game Boy Advance and PlayStation 1. So go ahead and find that folder that you backed up earlier, and then just drag all of the contents into the new BIOS folder. And that's basically it. And if you also saved off all of your save games, you're going to do that same process with the saves as well. But that's really about it. After you've moved over all of your files, we're ready to start working on the second SD card. So I'm going to take out the 16 gigabyte one, and I'm going to add that larger one, the 128 gig one. The most important thing you have to do here is you have to format it to FAT32 file system, and you have to use a special app called GUI Format to do that. Again, I'll have it linked in the written guide. And all you really have to do here is just make sure it's set to the correct SD card, and then give it a name. I'm just going to call this one Games, and then press Start. It's going to ask, do you really want to do it? And you know what to do. And that's it. You're done actually with the second SD card as well. We're good to go. Let's go ahead and put both of these cards into the device. In the first card slot, we're going to put that 16 gigabyte card with the Linux operating system. And on that second one, we're going to put the FAT32 formatted one that's 128 gigs. And all we need to do at this step is just power on the device and then power it back off again. What this is going to do is in the underlying background of the system, it's going to install a bunch of folders onto that second SD card. So that way we have the correct file system when we start putting all of our games onto there. So once you've booted up and closed down the system, go ahead and remove that second SD card and let's put it back into our computer. And so just like that, we now have a new file system available on that second SD card and we have a folder to put all of our different games into. And so each of these folders corresponds to a specific system that's emulated in the Linux operating system. So for example, if I want to take some of my Final Burn Neo games to play some classic arcade games, I can move them over to that Final Burn Neo folder. Now obviously I can't share where to find any of your game files, but if your device came with a separate 64 gigabyte SD card, you could actually just pull the games off of that if you wanted to. Or you could find them in the various ways that people find them on the internet. One thing to note here is each of these folders is going to have an info text file. If you open up that text file, it's going to show you all the file extensions that are accepted by that particular emulator. And so for this particular example, I'm using .gg files and they're going to work just fine. Another thing I've done here is I've moved over all of my media files as well, which includes images and videos. And I have a whole video guide about how to set this up ahead of time so you don't have to scrape everything on the actual device itself. And that's also going to be linked in the written guide in the video description below. Anyway, not to belabor the point, but this is basically all you have to do is just move over all your ROM files into the corresponding folder, and then you're going to be good to go. After that, you really don't need to mess with the SD card ever again on your computer, except to add more games. And so this is what it's going to look like when you first boot up that custom firmware image. And it might look a little bit different than the stock operating system. That's because I'm using a different theme. And if you go into the main menu by pressing start and then go into UI settings and then select theme set, you can see that there are about a dozen themes readily available. Additionally, if you go into the network settings section and then connect to your Wi-Fi network, you can then go into the updates and the download section and then the themes downloader. And then within there, you can find a bunch of different themes that you can install directly onto your device. So you're not just limited to this one theme that I'm using here. You can try out whatever one suits you the best. Okay, so like I mentioned before, I actually downloaded all of my media ahead of time. That's why you can see box arts and videos and things like that. And again, I have a written guide that'll show you how to do that directly onto your computer so you don't have to do it on the device. But let's go over to a system that doesn't have any media and I'll show you how to do that on your device if you choose to do it that way instead. So for example, here on Dreamcast, it doesn't have any sort of media here. You can go into the scrape section here and then you can set whatever parameters you'd like. For example, I like to use Box2D as my image source, and then I also like to scrape videos as well. After that, you need to put in a username and password, which you can get from screenscraper.fr, and then select Scrape Now, and you can start to scrape that specific section. It might take a bit to scrape, depending on how big your game file list is, 
But once it's done, go back to the main menu, then select Game Settings, Update Games List. And just like that, you're going to have all that different media available. So you can go ahead and do this on your device, or you can do it on your computer beforehand. It's really going to be up to you. So now let's actually test out some games, and I'm going to show you some of the tweaks that I've set up for you here to enhance your gameplay experience. We'll start with Game Boy first. We'll do Contra 3 Alien Wars. So a couple things you're going to notice. First thing here is that it has a green tint to it. And that's because it's using a special colorization that gives it this kind of mild green color to it. And this is my favorite look when it comes to emulating original Game Boy. On top of that, I've applied an LCD 3X overlay, which is actually a shader that provides this LCD grid look here on the screen. And I really like this because it just adds a little bit of a nostalgic flair to some of the handheld systems. And then another thing I want to mention is that I corrected the aspect ratio to be appropriate for the original Game Boy. It does result in some black bars on the left and right, but it just looks a lot better when it comes to the original aspect ratio. And one other thing I've done is I've changed all of the hotkeys to function off of the select button instead of the F button, which is on the bottom of the device. So to exit out of a game, you hold down select and then press start twice. And personally, I find that combo to be much more comfortable than trying to use the F button, which to me is too close to the reset button on the bottom here. So one other thing I've done is I've set up auto saves and auto load. What that means is as soon as you close out on any game, it's actually going to save it right before it closes out. And then when you start up that same game, it's going to load that exact spot that you closed it out on earlier. Okay, I've actually set up a whole hotkeys section for you in the written guide, but let me show you a few of them real quick. If you hit select and Y, it's going to toggle the frames per second. If you hit select and A, it's going to pause the emulation. And then if you hit select and X, it's going to bring up the RetroArch menu. And then also, if you hit select and B, it's going to reset the game for you so you can get back to the main screen. And that's handy if you don't want to auto load every single time. You can just reset the game when you start it up next time. If you hit select and R1, it's going to do a save state. And then if you hit select and L1, it's going to do a load state. And that's handy if you want to save a game at any time. On top of that, if you hit select and R2, it's going to toggle fast forward. That's really good for role playing games when you don't want to sit through all the cutscenes. And I've also set up a rewind function with select and L2. And this doesn't work on every system, but for Game Boy it does work. So if you happen to die, you can hit select an L2 and it's going to rewind back a few seconds so that you can maybe try over again. But yeah, in my example here with Game Boy, this is how everything's going to work. And Game Boy looks just gorgeous on this screen. I really love that green colorization. And then you mix that with the LCD filter and this large screen. Everything looks really nice. Same goes with Game Boy Color. It's going to be the exact same screen resolution and dimensions and everything else just in color. And it looks wonderful. But I would say the handheld that looks the best is by far Game Boy Advance. And that's because the original aspect ratio of 3 by 2 on this looks really good on the 5x3 display of the RG552. The Game Boy Advance screen is a 7x integer scale to fill out the 5x3 screen here. And it just looks incredible. By far, this is the best Game Boy Advance screen I've ever seen. And like I mentioned before, the fast forward button is going to be really handy in certain games, especially things like Pokemon. As you can see here, it's running almost 500 frames per second. That's going to be almost 10 times fast forward speed. And I know for a lot of Pokemon players, they don't like to sit through the original speed. So this is going to be really helpful. Now, another system I spent a lot of time with is the Super Nintendo. And this is using a 4 by 3 aspect ratio with a 5 times integer scale. What I had to do is go into the scaling section in RetroArch and actually set up a custom aspect ratio, as you can see here. And I have all this listed in the written guide if you're curious about it, but at the end of the day, it's all been pre-configured anyway, so Super Nintendo games are going to look really good here at 4x3 with a 5x vertical integer scaling. And if you haven't watched my RG552 review video, I really go into depth about how great this device is when it comes to retro gaming in particular. I've seen a lot of people getting really crazy about the analog pocket recently because it does such a good job of scaling up Game Boy, Game Boy Color, and Game Boy Advance games. Well, I would argue that the RG552 is very similar in that regard. For example, this is the best I've ever seen Super Nintendo looking on a handheld device. Not only does the 5x vertical integer scaling just look gorgeous on this, but the performance is really good as well. And you know, it's kind of apples and oranges. The analog pocket uses an FPGA technology, which is different than emulation. But all the same, the end result is very similar on the RG552. At the end of the day, this is probably the best I've seen most 8 and 16-bit systems ever look on a handheld device. And a lot of that has to do with the high-resolution 5x3 display that's available with this device in particular. And so yes, I get the fact that this device is expensive. It's $227 retail right now. 
But I don't know, if I take a step back and I kind of look at this device on its own and I don't compare it to other devices, the end result to me is still the same. It's giving me some of the most incredible 8-bit and 16-bit gameplay I've ever had on a handheld. And to me, that experience is worth $225 because it is so good. But that being said, you know, at that price point, you should expect a lot more out of a handheld device, especially when looking at the competition. But all the same, if somebody came to me in the middle of the night and said, hey, give me $227, and I'll make every Nintendo and Super Nintendo game work on a handheld device and it'll look perfectly for the rest of your life, I would probably go immediately to an ATM right then and there. Anyway, I'm gonna end that rant right here, but I'm just gonna say that I'm really happy with the RG552 and I've been enjoying it more and more each day, especially when I think about it in the context of 8-bit and 16-bit gameplay. Now, like I mentioned in the intro, the Linux operating system isn't really great for high-end gameplay, but it can do better than 16-bit systems too. For example, PlayStation 1 works really well too. Now, I've set this up for a 2x resolution upscale, and so your games are going to look a little bit sharper on this end than it does on the original PlayStation 1. With that being said, on the Android side, you can usually do a 3x resolution with no problems. But all the same, PlayStation 1 looks really good at 2x resolution, as you can see here too. On top of that, I've really been enjoying the arcade gameplay on the Linux operating system too. For the most part, Final Burn Neo and MAME 2003 Plus are going to be your go-to cores when it comes to arcade emulation. And unfortunately, it won't play some of the high-end stuff like Tekken or Killer Instinct. But all the same, your mid-90s and below games are all going to play flawlessly. Now, the aspect ratios on arcade games varied by game, but I do have this firmware image configured so that it should adjust on the fly. But that being said, if you do come across a game and it's not showing the correct aspect ratio, it is pretty easy to make some changes on a per game basis. So before we wrap up here, let me show you how to make some changes in case you want to do some adjustments to the firmware image later on. And believe it or not, we don't have to go into RetroArch to make these changes. We can do it directly in Bodicera. There's kind of a hierarchy when it comes to changing these settings, so let me show you the top one first, which is going to affect the entire system. If you go into the main menu and then Game Settings, here you can find different options that are already tweaked. I wouldn't recommend messing with any of these, but for example, if you wanted to turn off Auto Save and Load for every system across the board, you can turn that off here. But if you want to change it by console instead of the entire system here, you can go into the Per System Advanced Configuration and then select a system and then make those same changes here. For example, if I turn off Auto Save Load here for Game Boy, that means it's only going to turn off for all the Game Boy games. And on top of that, you can also do it on a game by game basis. For example, if we wanted to only make changes to Castlevania 2 without making any sort of adjustments to the entire system or all of the other Game Boy games, you can do that as well. What you're going to do here is hover over the game, then press the select button, and then select advanced game options. And so now it's going to show you all those same options, but specific to this one game in particular. So this is where we could turn off auto save load for one game, or you could adjust the aspect ratio, things like that. But yeah, that's how you would change the settings for the entire device, or for a specific system in particular, or for just one game at a time. All right, everyone, that's really about it for this video. I just wanted to show off this new SD card image that's available to you. So just go ahead and download it and flash it into your new SD card and you should be good to go. And so like I said before, I don't expect this to be a long lasting firmware image card. Right now we have a couple different people working on custom firmware for this device on the Linux operating system in particular. So I think in the coming weeks and months, we're gonna have much better software solutions. But in the meantime, I wanted to make sure we all had the best experience possible while we wait. Now, this Linux operating system is really only one of two operating systems available for this device, and so I plan on doing a different video for the Android operating system later on down the line. But for now, at least I feel good knowing that the Linux operating system is good to go at this point. I think when it comes to classic gameplay and having a nice user experience, the Linux operating system is actually better than the Android side. And so because of that, my recommendation is to use this side for retro gaming, and then try to use the Android side to push the device to its limits. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up things here, but let me know if you have any questions in the comments below, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful, and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.